Arr! Dave, what's wrong? I'm just so angry. Why? Injustice, Ted. Injustice makes me angry. Stick around for this D&D Adventurous League character build, The Justicar Barbarian. <laughs> Nerdarchist Dave here from Nerdarchy for Nerds by Nerds, hanging out with this nerd. Nerdarchist Ted. Welcome to Nerdarchy, a place for news, views, and homebrews for 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, as well as other role-playing games. Don't forget to crit hit that subscribe button and attune to that notification bell. Now, I know what you guys are thinking. You're thinking this very much looks like a barbarian build, but Dave is wearing armor. And, what self-respecting barbarian would wear armor? I don't know, one with a low con? Well, th that's true. But the truth of the matter is, the Barbarian can wear medium armor with no problems, no penalties. It's when they put on this, uh, the heavy armor that they receive problems. But why would our Barbarian want to wear armor in the first place? We got some reasons in this character build. Our uh, Barbarian, Path of the Justicar. Uh, if you want to follow along, you can do that in the character sheet in the description below. There's a link to D&D Beyond, uh, sponsor for this video, which we're very grateful for, as well as you can also take a look at the DMs Guild to download uh, the PDF that's pay what you want to see how we build this character build. And let's, so let's get into it. Let's get into our, our just a car. This build is kind of built on a character that I'm kind of, you know, looking looking to play. Uh, I, 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 you know, started saying, you know, number one, we've been talking for a while that dwarf is the superior race, and we haven't done a dwarf build yet. Indubitably. So, so I wanted to build something dwarf related. Now, I, you know, there are some other uh, ideas we could do anyway. So I guess the concept is of this is for an order of spiritual warriors that you know that are powered by. Their, their faith and their ancestors, and they they kind of worship the ancestors. Absolutely. If we're talking dwarf, you know, we can discount all the other races. Uh, but, you know, when you're looking at, you know, this type of thing, you know, other races would wind up working with this this particular build. We always talk about the, the human, the half-elf, and, you know, the, and the, the Warforged Envoy are really good at anything, you know, when when it comes down to it, so you could really go in that direction. But what other races, you know, might wind up working here? You know, even though we know we're gonna go with dwarf. Yeah, I feel like thematically, um, any race that feels like they'd be deeply tied to their to their ancestors, or be kind of like primitive and tribal. So uh, tr half work comes to mind. I, I feel like. Um, Dragonborn would work as well, and there's probably a bunch of others. Those are all strong, strong choices. They both, you know, get that that bonus to you know strength and you know possibly you know charisma. So that would wind up working for you know what what we've got going on here. Uh, so what's next? All right. So one is the the concept for this for this build anyway. I don't think we've really explained it. Yeah, and we keep talking about ancestors, but we also want this character to be kind of like divinely inspired as well. So it's almost like a religious order is how is how I'm seeing it. You know, a, a sect of warriors in a orc tribe would work really well or you know, a, a priest order in in a dwarven society, almost like Knights Templar, mm -hmm. right? Which is really far removed from barbarians. Now we've had battle ragers that are been uh, documented in Forgotten Realms novels, but you know we're talking about ancestor worship. So to me, you know, that screams ancestral guardian path. I I would wholeheartedly agree. Um, you know, this is something that like I find of the different barbarian paths, this is the one that speaks to me the most, uh, and it al also allows you to take a different path than you normally would with barbarian. Yes, joke intended there. Uh, you know, typically barbarians are meant to, or are thought to be, you know, stupid and idiotic, and all they do is just, you know, go and hit things with a great axe or a great sword. Rage, chew you on know. their sword, as the case may be. <laughs> but, you know, here you could have someone who's, you know, even if they don't have the mental stats to back it up, you know, they could be a little bit more solemn. You know, they, they could have... Reverent. Reverent. They could have these interactions, you know, with these spirits that maybe others don't see, and... Yeah, that could be why they're, you know, perceived as lower, lower, you know, mental faculties, but they're really like in constant, um, you know, seances with with their ancestors that are awakened through this barbarian path. 
Now, we've already mentioned the fact that this is an Adventures League legal build. Uh, we know we can use PHB plus one. In this case, we've mentioned Ancestral Guardians. Therefore, uh, that we have to use Denethor's Guard to everything. So that limits us on what we can do anyway. We already said we wanted to pick a dwarf. And also, as we progress in this build, we are going in to go in to dip into other classes. In this case, we're going to also use completely combining Barbarian with Paladin. That's why we're wearing armor, because what self-respecting Paladin would go into battle without armor. And, you know, dwarves prefer to wear armor as well. Absolutely. So we already know our, our race is Mountain Dwarf. Our starting class is going to be Barbarian. Now we're going to need a background. All right. So we already talked about this being very uh, divinely oriented. So the like, obvious choice here is going to be Acolyte. Yes. I mean, before we kind of nailed things down and went in the direction of, oh, this is kind of like a religious order. Uh, you know, we, you are throwing out some other things like Guild Artisan because with being a dwarf, that makes a lot of sense. Right. But in this case, we felt like the spiritual training was actually going to supersede that, be more important. We weren't going to get those vet bar, uh, paladin levels for a while. So right from the, uh, the get-go, we wanted a certain kind of feel, and Acolyte's going to give that to us. You know, taking religion and insight, uh, as granted to us by Acolyte, is going to really lift this barbarian character. When you're not raging, when you're not engaged in combat, you are going to feel that much more, you know, integral to the rest of the to the rest of the group as you might be able to offer you know uh your insight into you know religion and the gods and and i feel like that kind of character you're not you're not limited you've got those intelligent skills to rely on you're not gonna you might not be the best at them depending upon where you put your starting stats but i still feel like you know you're you're that much closer to you know you know uh, a more useful character Enlightened. We're closer to yeah, being enlightened. Go. There you go. And then from Barbarian, what we're, we took for our starting skills were Intimidation and Athletics. Uh, it was mainly by process of elimination because a lot of our skills tend to be nature-oriented. And even though we're playing a Barbarian in this case, he's not really that kind of Barbarian. <laughs> this is not the guy that's you know going to be walking around in the wilderness. He's trained you know within the within the mountains you know w within the dwarven stronghold you know to be this this you know religious warrior. I was going to say zealot, but that's a whole different path. <laughs> that's a different path, which could be interchangeable as well. So uh, with this build, we're going to bum rush Barbarian for quite a while, I believe. Uh, you know, wh whenever you're talking about using a melee class, uh, we know that we get extra attack at fifth level. You know, regardless of whether it be fighter, ranger, paladin, uh, barbarian, all of them get that extra attack at fifth level. And if you're going to go with a melee based character, every level that you decide to push out and get that extra attack later is going to hurt you um, mechanically, you know, when, when you're dealing with, you know, your, your party members. So I felt it would, you needed to go to all the way to five. Yeah, well, not only that, too. It's like you might as well get your your Barbarian Path anyway, your subclass for your for your class, and that's three levels. When you're at three levels, you're like, one more level, and I, I get an ASI uh, ability score increase or feat. So it's like, well, I might as well take one more level, right? And now we're talking about a fighting class, so it's like, well... One more level and I get extra attack, so I might as well take one more level. So now you're at five. All right. So, you know, now we're, we're heavily invested in the Barbarian. But I feel at this point in time, we really need to begin our, our investiture into Paladin. Well, before we get there, though, we did get that ASI or feet, and we decided to take the stat bump. All right, so let's let's actually you know jump backwards and talk about where we put our starting stats. Okay. All right, so our starting stats we have fourteen strength, twelve dexterity, fifteen constitution, eight intelligence, ten wisdom, thirteen charisma, and we have reasons for you know why why we put it all all there. Uh, We're a mountain dwarf, so we get. Two plus twos. You get a plus two to strength and a plus two to constitution, bringing us to a starting uh, strength of 16 and a starting con of 17. This is going to be a very tanky character. Right. So that brings us to our, to our stat adjustment, which is what we went with. Instead of going with a feat, we have two odd stats. We were like, well, we might as well even them out. Adding extra con, really good. If we happen to find ourselves without armor, then it's going to increase our armor class. It's going to increase our hit points. It's going to increase our saving throw. It's super important. And also, we plan on going Paladin eventually. So we have a 13 in Charisma. Why not just bring it up now and get a 14? We'll have even stats across the board. Yeah, now, now here, 
you know, while going with that plus one to, to charisma, while it's not going to get us a lot overall, what that does do is that shows, you know, possibly to those divinely inspired that there is improvement and thus showing that there is a progression here and possibly allowing, you know, an NPC or, you know, something to take notice of this, this particular, uh, you know, dwarf and allow them to possibly begin their training for, you know, levels in Paladin. A rise, young champion, would be. Uh, we, we did already have the 13 that was required to make Paladin, but going with that plus two modifier, you know, now means that once you do have those Paladin levels, those, those bonuses are going to be a little bit more. And let's face it, you're a dwarf, so if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. <laughs> uh, so as we said, if at a sixth level, we're going to start Paladin, and we're going to bum rush this. Uh, and it winds up going along the same the same path. Uh, you go to third level to be able to get your uh, oath. And there was uh, there was some definitely talk off camera as to which direction we wanted to go. Did we want to go devotion? Did we want to go vengeance? Uh, you know, Nathan Nerdock, he actually put forth, uh, you know, Oath of the Crown. Uh, it's very Dwarven-like, but for, for this one, it felt... Um, Impossible, like, because we are building an Avengers League legal character. Well, there, there is that, uh, you know, it, it also, you know, wound up like not fitting the proper theme. Uh, so we thought, you know, devotion or did we, you know, did we want to go with vengeance? So both of them work very heavily. Um, and actually with what we actually chose, we can circle back to our background a little bit. Devotion is very much about, you know, being connected to your ancestors and using that to protect those that have come after them. Vengeance really speaks a lot to... Uh, you know, sl going after those who have slighted your people. And that's the direction we went in. Uh, uh, and so that's why we actually, when we took Acolyte, we got two languages and we chose languages of traditional Dwarven, Dwarven enemies. Uh, so we took Giant, we took Orc. Right, kind of so it circles back to that. So by either, either Devotion or uh, Vengeance work really well. Oath of the Crown, I actually like that a lot. If this wasn't an Adventures League legal one, uh, you know, for my League of Legends players out there, Jarvan, you know, always uh, screams Oath of the Crown Paladin to me for Demacia. Uh, and I, I like that build. I got to play it in a uh, uh, Drunks and Dragons game nice. or Drinks and Dragons game uh, last month. So it's a lot of fun and that would work. But like we said, we're sticking with Adventure League legal here. All right. So, you know, for our particular build, we're going with Oath of Vengeance. Uh, fourth level, we get that ASI. Uh, and it's like, okay, you know, take, you know. We get an important decision even before then. Oh. Fighting style. Oh, that's right. One of the sweetest things about being a barbarian and multi-classing into another fighting class is it gives you access to a fighting style. So Paladin does not offer a huge amount of variety. What did we wind up taking? So we were really torn between the defensive style and the uh, great weapon style. Protection was out because we are not fighting with a shield. Right. And uh, Duelist was not an option as well because we were fighting with a two-handed weapon. In this case, we decided uh, our, our, our weapon of choice is going to be either a great sword or a great axe. So we decided to go with uh, the defense, defensive style to increase our armor class to offset the fact that this character probably is never going to have a very high uh, dexterity. Right. So we'll, we'll wear armor, and while, while wearing the armor, we get that extra plus one. Nice. Then we can go into the yes side. Yeah, so so here, you know, we look at, you know, needing, you know, our higher strength. It's going to it's going to do us well. It's gonna be our athletics checks. It's going to be our strength saving throws. We're gonna hit things with it. And we're gonna hit things with it, which, you know, when it comes down to it, this character is a barbarian. He is a melee based character, and that's gonna be a plus one to hit, that's gonna be plus one to damage. It's gonna be needed all the time. Yeah, so now we have that eighteen strength, twelve dex. 18 Constitution, 8 Intelligence, 10 Wisdom, and 14, 14 Charisma. Charisma. So we're looking pretty good with stats so far, I think. So we've already, we've already you know, chosen our fighting style. We, we chose our Oath. We got a stat bump. Fifth level for the, the Paladin winds up being access to second level spells. We get, you know, those extra D8s for smite damage. It was hard to pass those up. So we're going to take five, five levels of Barbarian, five levels of Paladin, and now we're a 10th level character. Right. So one of the downsides about being a Paladin and being able to cast spells is while you're raging, you cannot cast spells. You cannot concentrate on spells. 
But what you can do with spells is turn them into your smites. Absolutely. So uh, this makes for an interesting use for our spells. We probably won't be casting many spells. The spell selections that we did make were basically spells that we would probably cast outside of combat, uh, curing and things of that nature, because this guy is probably going to be just using them for smite when he's in the thick of it. Yeah, and, that, and that's the that's the great part about this build. This is what I was looking for uh, when I was putting this, uh, the, you know, workshopping this idea, putting it together. Um, you know, the Paladin's got the ability to lay on hands and be able to use those things. It doesn't count as spells. It's up to your DM as to whether or not you're allowed to use that while you're raging. Um, you know, but it's it's going to be one of those things that outside of combat you can get rid of you know poisons and diseases and cure you know and not and not waste your smites. Technically, you would be able to use lay on hands in combat while raging, and maintain your rage as long as somebody hits you. So like <laughs> as long as the enemy is attacking you, then it's legit. But if it so happens that round you do not get attacked, you lay on hands, then uh, you're going to come out of your rage. Right. Well. So after Paladin, our five-level dip in Paladin, I think we're going back to the Barbarian. Yeah, you know, we're we're gonna need to put some more time into Barbarian, and there's there's different things that I was looking for uh, when I was putting this together. Uh, you're gonna get you're gonna you know be able to recklessly attack. You're gonna be out there, and so you know chances are that you know with your attacks you're gonna have that better chance of critting, and I wanted that brutal crit. So you're going all the way up to ninth level in in Barbarian. Absolutely. So if you if you take another four levels of Barbarian, uh, you're going to get another stat bump, which uh, at this point in time, that we're going to take that and max out our strength to, to be a 20. And then we're going to get the brutal, the brutal Critical and that Rage uh, Damage bonus goes up to a 3. And then from there, after, uh, after we get those uh, four levels in Barbarian, we're taking all the way to level 20 in Paladin. We're going to max out Paladin, I believe, at 11th level. Uh, 11 levels of Paladin, 9 levels of Barbarian, I, I felt was the, the best mix. If you re weren't really as uh, caring about that extra one point of damage from Rage and the Brutal Critical, like you could split this in a, in a lot of different different ways depending upon what you were looking for. There was some you know negotiations and discussions about an 8-12 to maximize the number of stat bumps. Uh, you know, but I, I decided, you know, our... You know, I put forth the opinion that you know brutal critical as well as the improved divine smite you know, that you get at that twentieth level with this build uh, was, was what I was looking for. Well, even if you were to flip it on its head and go with uh, eleven levels of barbarian and nine levels of paladin, would be super strong as well. It's just not the way we went this time because relentless rage is so good, and when you combine that with a paladin who's getting a bonus to their saving throws. You could easily get not not be dropped twice from Relentless Rage. Third time is possible. Fourth time, probably not. But it's not out of the realm of possibility. That is true. Uh, you get Aura of Courage at, at 10th and the Improved Divine Smite at 11th. So you would be sacrificing, you know, those Paladin abilities to get the Relentless Rage. So you know, it really comes down to, you know, how you want to level split it. Exactly. But like we said, in this case, we went Paladin all the way. So 11 levels of Paladin. So we're going to get our final stat adjustment and we're going to put it in con uh, to up it to a 20 con. Now we have a 20 strength, a 20 con. Uh, this guy is going to be a powerhouse on the battlefield. He, he's going to he's going to wreck some stuff. Uh, it seems to be, you know, overall, it's a lot of fun, you know, with this thing. So how would someone, you know, ta you know taking this uh, particular build, uh, how would you use something like this in a game? Okay. So, one, I like the idea of the order. So we could have lesser versions and a greater versions. Uh, and, I, you know, what? the way I would like to use this is the misunderstanding. Because these aren't really bad guys, but they're very bad found by duty they're very mired in their ways and maybe you have you're carrying dwarven artifacts or, or things that are precious to them and their order and they're treating you like a grave robber so you could do it like any great comic book crossover where it starts off with you fighting each other yeah that would be really amusing 
Um, especially if it were something where, like, the barbarians would flee if they're being defeated to go and, you know, get help or go and get, you know, someone else. You know, so you do the deviation from the normal combat of, you know, oh, everybody fights to death. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, they come back with these guys to try and to win the day. And, you know, either you guys kill each other or you work it out. Either way would be great. Or, you know... For whatever reason, maybe it's a case of mistaken identity, or maybe these guys aren't really nice, right? Uh, the these uh, even though they're mountain dwarves, doesn't necessarily mean they have to be good or even the good guys, uh, you know. So uh, you could be traveling with folks that are of giant blood, like Goliaths. Maybe dwarves don't these these dwarves do not differentiate between Goliaths and other giants. You know, they see you as being giant blooded or maybe there's half orcs in the group and, you know, one green skin isn't as good as another to them and they just want them dead. Uh, you know, so basically they're big, they're prejudiced and they're bigots. That could work. Uh, you know, I, I could see that you could take this and, you know, as the, as the enemies, you know, as they begin to, to fight, you know, perhaps there is a, a spectral, uh, you know, visions, or not visions, but a spectral apparitions that of the spirits of the ancestors, when they go into a rage, they scream, they enter the fray, and these, you know, guardians, you know, circle, circle around them, you know, almost like a spirit guardians type effect, even if, like, you're not actually using that spell, you know, just to, to kind of make the combat that much more interesting to describe. And flavorful. Uh, the other idea is you, you've you actually, you're dungeon crawling, right? You're doing a dungeon delve, and it's an old dwarven hold. And, and one of the defenders is an undead dwarf, you know, one of our Justicars. And, like, this could be the variation on a death knight. But this guy, you know, he is defending his homeland uh, that was overrun by monsters eons ago or whatever. And now you're clearing out the dungeon, and he just sees another invader. All of these things, you know, work. Uh, I think it's a, you know, a, a fun thing that you could be able to do and, you know, use in your game, you know, if you wanted to use it as a GM. But the question is, folks, how would you use it in your game? we got a place where we can talk about it. That is down in the comments below. While you're at it, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Uh, don't, while you're down there, don't forget to stop by the description and check out the link to D&D Beyond and uh, the character build guide over on the DMs Guild. So until next time, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy.